Uh, we have a, one of our authors speaking today. I'd like to introduce him and tell you a little bit about him. His name is Richard Rick Halsey, and he's an educator, a teacher, a photographer, the founder of the California Chaparral Institute. Uh, a very, very special person that um, has been really connected to the to our chaparral habitats uh, that many of you know about and can learn more about through the Chaparral Institute. Uh, it's a nonprofit group that he has founded uh, that helps you learn about the shrublands surrounding the San Diego area. Rick is the author of a couple of special Sunbelt books, one of which is Fire, Chaparral, and Survival in Southern California. Uh, this is in its second edition, and it's a wonderful book. It, it has a lot of color photographs of, of the plants that are found in the chaparral and everything you want to know about protecting your houses and living in an area that is a, adjusted to fire. Another book that he has, which is really great for if you have a, adults or kids that want to learn how to uh, uh, color books and learn uh, at the same time is this coloring nature uh, in the shop in the California chaparral and what it does feature is a lot of the wonderful photography of Rick Halsey that has been transformed into coloring books and all kinds of added information. These books are available from Sunbelt Publications and you can find them online or you can Paul Sunbelt. They're being discounted for this special talk that we have. Uh, and also, if you uh, do order online, be, be sure and put a note that you want a signed copy. Rick will uh, be happy to sign copies, personalize them to you. And I really want to welcome you to our Sunbelt Spotlight. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Rick. Great. Thanks, Diana. Thanks, Rebecca, for setting this thing up. Hi, everybody. So oh. Zoom. Uh, Zoom exchange here. It's um, a poor replacement to actually being in person, but I think that that's the best we can do right now. It's kind of ironic because we're going to talk about nature, and here we are wrapped in our little sequestered environments. So first of all, what I want to ask yourselves, and just think about this for a minute. Uh, when you're out in nature recently, um, and probably hopefully it's been more times than not, especially because of the pan pandemic, uh, just think about how it makes you feel. Uh, maybe where you went, you were with somebody, a friend, or just by yourself. When you went out the last time, um, think about how you felt out there just for a second. Yeah, so we're going to um, break out in the little rooms a little later and we can discuss some of your thoughts on this, but based on my previous conversations with folks when I've done this in, in person, is pretty much everybody feels like, well, I'm a lot more relaxed out of nature. Um, I feel energized. I get inspired. And um, I remember when I first started uh, teaching about local biology, we had a canyon below our high school. And I was standing up there in front of my class of high school biology students uh, teaching about photosynthesis. And I'm sure it was a brilliant lecture, but <laughs> I had my back door opened up and um, it was one of those warm Santa Ana wind days. It was, it was, it was, it was a morning. And uh, in flew this sycamore leaf and spun around on the linoleum for a few seconds. And I was in the middle of some poignant point and I looked down there and I thought to myself, you know, what in the hell am I doing? Who's, who's barking? Somebody, somebody should mute that. <laughs> um, I thought to myself, what am I doing um, teaching about nature inside of a classroom without interacting with, with nature itself? So at that point, I dropped my lecture notes and, and uh, we went outside and the kids were kind of shocked, but we went down to the canyon below our school and People got a little anxious, a little dirty. Some kids got kind of angry because their clothes got messed up. But it made me realize that the best way to really learn about nature is to be in nature. And what I want to do now is to share a few things with you to help you understand why it isn't just sort of a recreational thing or an educational thing. It taps into our physiology, our, our mental processes. It's, it's a genetic link that, that's very, um, 
very pivotal to who we are, and sometimes we forget about it to our own detriment. So let me um, share this screen here. Uh, Rebecca, can I do that? I think so. Okay, let me give it a shot here. Okay, here we go. So this is out in the Santa Monica Mountains, by the way, if you've ever been up there, it's a beautiful chaparral studded landscape. Um, this is the road, I think, um, right above Topanga. So uh, think about it for a minute. The last time you had a little animal or a little natural visitor come see you and how it made you feel. And I, I bet you it's going to very, be very similar to what um, I felt like with this little character here. So uh, put your little hands up because there's a little uh, device down below if you know how to use it, if you know what bird this is. It's not a chaparral bird. It's uh, You find mostly these species in the riparian area. This is a yellow chat. And um, this is right outside my bedroom window. And he was tapping on the screen. <laughs> and he was very curious about me, I thought. I, I think more likely he was looking at his own reflection. But you know, uh, there was a time in our history when we were intimately connected with animals. They were just part of our life. And I'd hazard to say that most of you love to be with animals. Uh, it's not only because some of them, especially dogs and maybe cats, depending on what kind of cat you got. <laughs> it's unconditional love, right? But what's important there is you're connecting with a different species. And, and it feels good. And the reason it feels good is because that's what we used to do all the time. And so when you connect with a little animal like this, you know, you get your cameras and you just get excited and try to record what you see. It really taps into something very deep inside. Uh, it's, there's a word called atavistic, which is sort of related to uh, what one's genetic inheritance does when you um, encounter something. It brings up some ancestral deep, deep evolutionary drive that uh, we all have. And so when you see an animal like this or any kind of wild animal and they get close to you, it brings up an atavistic tendency to reach out and want to connect. And that's, uh, it's very easy and it's very easy to do if you just, just go outside and take a look. And oftentimes we, we get so wrapped up in our lives we forget to do that. So I have a little chart here that um, helps me kind of uh, get my head around this. And it's basically about the percent time outdoors over time and what's happened to our society and uh, our species behaviors. So um, if you take a look down below, um, about 3 million years ago, that's the year time frame, uh, we were pretty much outdoors all the time. And the first thing that really took us out from that environment was tools. And that was about a, 2 million and a half years ago. And we're talking stone tools, breaking things together and making shapes, sharp objects. Um, and so, the, the, the graph line there on the uh, vertical axis, that's percent time outdoors. So at that juncture, even though we may still have been outdoors, we kind of got into our heads a little bit outside of the surrounding environment to make those tools. And then the next big switch I think happened when we introduced fire to our uh, lifestyles. And that was a huge, huge event because when you think about fire and what evolutionary adaptation that provides, it's pretty big. Uh, but socially, I think it's as much as important as it is to keep warm and protect yourselves, protect yourselves from wild animals. I um, mean, think about what happens around a fire. Um, and it's, uh, it's a very communal experience. I often talk about when I give presentations, you know, it's a kind of a date tip. If, if you want to go on a, on a date with uh, someone the first time, you want to go somewhere where there's going to be a campfire because if things get awkward, what do you do? To stare into the fire, right? And it's almost hypnotic, and it's everybody feels the same way. So what is that? It's the same thing that you felt when you look at that wild animal. It's an atavistic throwback to a time when that was a pivotal part of our life. And people in our species that did not like fire, they were afraid of it, they're not around anymore. So those of us who learn to appreciate fire and, and be attracted to it, um, survive better than those who didn't. So hence, that's why when you stare at a fire, it's hypnotic. It, it's, it's, it's a nice thing to do. It makes you feel good. And that's, you're talking a million years of evolution or, that caused that. So once we had fire, we were taken out of the uh, 
the outdoors a little bit more, and then you get into agriculture. And that was about 10,000 years ago uh, for the most part. And boy, that really changed things quite dramatically because then all of a sudden there's things people can accumulate, there's, there's, there's power structures, there's cities, and pretty soon large civilizations to the point where now we're indoors a lot and you see the line drops off considerably there. Um, the Industrial Revolution about 200 years ago, remember your textbooks from high school, um, those really draconian pictures of those people in those factories, you know, with the dirt and the dust and dark environments. And then I don't think you can see it because it's kind of off the screen there. But um, not too long ago, we developed cars. And that was really the first time we'd be self-contained completely outside, but inside, right? And then um, the data that I was working with with this chart was at about um, 2003, they, they figured about 7% of our time now is, is outdoors, when it used to be 100%. So that was before cell phones became common. So you can imagine uh, that number has probably dropped, uh, dropped dramatically since then. So what, what impact has this had on, on our physiologies and who we are? So uh, there's a couple things, namely physiological. I mean, those are the things we feel. Um, we have higher cortisol levels, which is a uh, hormone or it comes out of the top of your adrenal glands, um, on top of your kidneys, excuse me, um, your adrenal glands. Um, it's an important thing. It allows you to either react, fight, flight, that kind of a thing. But if it's on all the time, it's a problem and it causes all sorts of physiological uh, issues. Um, and, and why is it on all the time now? Because I don't know how many of you have been in a classroom, for example, and um, the fluorescent lights are on or you live near a freeway and there's that constant background noise, you may consciously try to block it out, but your subconscious hears it all the time. And that's what induces the cortisol level. It's reacting to that stress in the environment. So consequently, we're more irritable, more distracted. Our brains don't work as well. And we develop all sorts of strange things to, to respond to that. We have neuroses, compulsive reactions, um, you know, the, in the old days, road rage was one of the classic examples of this. Um, now it's online rage, right? It's, <laughs> it seems to be transferred into that. And those reactions we have to each other and, and ourselves, I think primarily are a direct consequence of being inside and all the consequences that civilization has created to maintain the power structure, to suppress certain groups of people, I mean, all of these things. Um, and so a lot of conversation, uh, fortunately, this last few months has been focused on inequality. And, you know, the, the, the health consequences of being in a society that you know is not made for you, it's a 24-7 stress level. And uh, I'm pretty convinced that that's one of the reasons why African Americans have higher heart disease problems, um, cancer problems. It's, uh, combined not only with the environment they're living in, but also the continual stress of knowing that you don't belong. So that has a tremendous impact on, on who you are and how you react. So what's the solution to this? Well, I think it's pretty clear. Uh, we got to go outside, right? And I've come up with a few things that can keep you focused in this. And it's got to be a cognitive thing. It's got to be something you're going to do all the time because you can't just go out and expect to get all the benefits of being outside and reconnecting with your inner self. Um, you got to kind of be conscious of it. So you got to get outside. That's the first thing. And when you do that, your cortisol levels go down, your heart rate goes down, your blood pressure goes down, your killer T cell count goes up, which is an essential part of your immune system. Um, but what's really interesting is if you go outside and you know, you know, you're going outside and you know, it helps you that conscious awareness. It's almost like that, um, uh, placebo effect. You know, when you think something's going to help you, it actually sometimes does more than otherwise. When you know this, your, your blood pressure goes down even more and all the other things uh, increase in benefit too. So you can go out and motorbike or, or dirt bike or jog or have a friend with you and have phone things stuck in your ear and you'll still get some benefits. But if you unplug and are conscious about the experience, um, it doubles the, the the benefits. And then connections, 
Um, you know, I don't know how many of you have heard about the blue zones, those places on the world, in the world where people live to 100 and something. Um, and one of the key components of the communities like that is they connect with each other. There's intimate connections with people and their environment. And um, ironically, I think this pandemic has caused a lot of us to learn the importance of that. I've met my neighbors in a way I never would have met them before this whole thing. And it's felt good. So connecting with the environment you live in, actually know where you live. So when you walk outside, um, you have a sense of belonging. And when you know what belongs, you become part of that system. And the other thing that's important is, is engaging this process with everybody. Um, and what does that mean? Well, if you want to take it beyond the first level of personal growth and improvement, that, that's what we are actually talking about this last three or four months with all the protests and everything else. Um, it's important to reach out, especially beyond your own socioeconomic group, because once you've learned the magic of being outdoors and all the benefits of it, uh, it's important to share that information, not only with your own family members and your you know, normal social group, but also reaching out to other people in a sense that uh, you show you care and you want to help other people reconnect with, with nature and, and feel better about themselves. And it creates a more empathetic uh, environment where people just feel good about themselves and consequently live a lot longer and a lot happier. So we're sensory beings and there's a few things here that are important. Um, sounds important when you hear wind, when you hear birds, when you hear water, you know what happens. The cortisol levels go down, your heart rate goes down. It's just a physiological response. And then fragrances. When you smell nature, and I don't know how many of you had those experiences when you go out and there's a smell or a fragrance. It could have been someone you know. <laughs> it could have been an environment that you came in. Um, when you hear that, when you sense that smell, it takes you right back. And fragrance is one of those powerful senses a person has. And so when you go outdoors and you smell the pine trees, that's a powerful feeling um, uh, for me that is elicited. Not only that, because I, I can hear the sound of the wind going through the pine needles. And, and what does that remind me of? Well, it reminds me of all those backpacking trips I took in the Sierra. And it just takes me right back there. Um, so fragrance is an important thing. And the reason I'm going through this because we're sensory beings and you gotta be consciously doing this. You, you take a walk and you won't really smell something unless it's like, wow, it hits you all of a sudden. But when you think about smelling and fragrances, you're consciously doing this, all of a sudden the whole world opens up again. And one thing I'd like to challenge you to do is, is instead of driving to the donut shop or the local store, if it's nearby, ride your bike or just walk and learn about the neighborhood you live in the smells, the sounds, the fragrances, the people. It, it's, it's a whole different environment. And that's what we used to do all the time. And we've isolated ourselves to the point of, you know, physiological and mental health consequences. A visual is very important. This whole scene here um, has a lot of fractals in it. And fractals are self-repeating patterns. And if you look at this manzanita, this is a xylococcus bicolor. It's a common manzanita in San Diego County. And there's some up in the LA County, I think. Um, but if you look at the pattern, it kind of branches off like this. And I don't know if any of you have a bonsai uh, tree in your backyard. Uh, you've done that as an art project or something. The Japanese are really keen into this whole aspect. If you look at bonsai trees, basically they are repeating patterns. And you look at them and it feels good. Uh, and why is that? Because that's what nature looks like. And that's what we're used to looking at. And it's tapping deep inside into our collective subconscious. And you don't know why it feels good. Why, why when I sit outside and look at this scene, what, what's going on there? You're, you're smelling things that you did a half a million years ago when you're out on the savannah. You're seeing things from a half a million years ago when you used to be out on the savannah. You're, you're, you're feeling things. I mean, it's all tapped into this environment. That's why you feel good because you're back home. And that's the es essential uh, ingredient of why nature can, can uh, help you get reconnected with what really, really matters. 
So we're full sensory beings. And there's, um, there's a sense here that I haven't really talked about yet. Here, uh, let me, I have an assistant I can bring up. So this is Cooper. He's our chief spiritual officer for the Chaparral Institute. And um, he, uh, he's very soft. And uh, it feels good to pet him. And you know that people have programs where they take pets to uh, hospices and help people that are near death feel better, cancer patients. Um, what's going on there? Well, here's the secret. <laughs> this little guy is the wolf that sat next to you by that fire a half a million years ago. And you're tapping right into that right now. Is that right? Are you a wolf? <laughs> so animals, pets, are really one of the best ways to reconnect instantly. Actually, our dogs and cats, if you look at them in the eyes, I mean, you know what I'm talking about. They're just, it, there's something going on there, and that's what it is. You're hooking back into your ancestry. So for those of you that uh, want a little science, there's a whole bunch of things that we've learned. Um, and what I can do, uh, maybe, uh, I don't know how we can do this. Uh, I can send a list of papers um, that uh, support all the things I'm talking about. I don't know, uh, Rebecca or Diana, maybe we can come up with a way at, at the end of this. You can help me. Uh, maybe I can put it in the chat and people can, um, that's what I'll do. People can uh, get it there. But there's uh, research that's made this really clear. And if you want to, the, the components I've been talking about, if you want to uh, read a book that's really good, it's called The Nature Fix by Florence Williams, uh, The Nature Fix. Um, and it talks about the three-day effect, which actually is a podcast. It's an audio book, I think. Yeah, it's an audio book um, called The Three-Day Effect. It's sort of a, a bridge version of The Nature Fix. And it's available on uh, audio books. But she talks about how after three days in the wilderness, something happens. And uh, all these things that this science here that I'm going to um, show you helps prove it just does something to you that um, you can't get any other way. Um, there's things out in nature that uh, have been shown to do some pretty remarkable things. For example, when people see green over a period of time, and it doesn't even have to be a tree, it can be a green wall, their aggression drops dramatically. That's why I uh, have several of my rooms at home here. I painted them green, I painted them green. <laughs> Um, in England, they studied millions of medical cases, and they, 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 they discovered that there was a 4 to 5% drop in cardio uh, disease in, in England when people had exposure to green in their environment. And they, they tried to control for all the other variables, socioeconomic and everything, access to parks, uh, being able to see the park across the way. Uh, wilderness, this is what that three-day effect is all about. One of the key components in um, PTSD uh, therapy is to take people out of their wilderness. It, it, it does a remarkable job of recentering you. So the issue here is the importance of non-conscious time. And as you know, you know, you're sitting here every day with this phone and it's always, it's always getting your attention. And you know, I know all of us have various levels of tolerance for this kind of thing, but um, You've got to be bored to be creative. You've got to be bored to connect to people in a proper way. You've got to have unconscious time. And that's when you're just able to sit there and zone out. And that's what people say, I'm gonna go watch a television show or whatever. You really just need to shut down everything. And the electronic world now is so overwhelming. Um, you have to make a conscious decision now to remove yourself from it to the point where if you haven't had at least an hour away from this, electronic world we're in every day, uh, you know, it's toxic. So it's something to work on. So this is a friend of mine, Tree Girl, if you can see her up in the tree there. Um, she goes all around the world and, and gets in trees naked and takes pictures of herself. She hasn't gotten in trouble yet, but I mean, what's that all about? <laughs> so this is how she expresses her own uh, experience out there. And she has this quote that I've always liked, you down with the frontal lobe, up with the cerebellum. And your frontal lobe is where all your consciousness is, right? Your, your thinking and all. Your cerebellum is where more of your atavistic subconscious 
material is. And you just have to turn this off. And this is what nature helps you do. You know this. You sit on a park bench and just sit there. Keep off your phone. Put the newspaper away or whatever you do. And just, just watch. And that used to be what people did a lot. And fewer people are doing it now. Just by doing that, um, all these health benefits come to the fore. And here's one of my favorite quotes. Um, how happy I am to be able to walk amongst the shrubs, the trees, the woods. And I can't read that other thing. What does that say? It's off my screen. And uh, something. <laughs> and the rocks. So the woods and the trees and the rocks give us the resonance we need. Um, that was Beethoven said that. Um, and a little aside to this, Beethoven, as you probably know, um, uh, lost his hearing. And at one point, and some of his most remarkably talented and beautiful stuff happened after he lost his hearing. And I'm, I speculate a lot of it had to do with two things. One, he wasn't distracted anymore by outside stimuli. He was able to concentrate. And also, he couldn't hear the negativity anymore. You know, he not only didn't care what people thought, he couldn't hear them anyway. So that we're constantly constrained by people's opinions of ourselves and the judgment that's out there. Nature doesn't care whether you're rich, poor, you think you're ugly or beautiful, or you got a lot of you know ticks on your resume. You can trip over a rock like anybody else, hit your head and die. It, it doesn't judge you. And I think maybe you've all experienced this at one point when you're out hiking or you're out in the wilderness. At, at some point, uh, things don't matter that they used to anymore. Neuroses disappear. You're less inhibited. You're able to go out and do things. I mean, there's a reason that happens out in nature because we're not being constrained anymore by artificial civilized patterns. So forming connections with your local environment is really important. That's what this whole little seminar is all about today. And we're gonna talk about that in a second in groups. But just find your local environment, whatever it is. And it could be just a park. It doesn't have to be a wilderness area. But find a place you can connect with and, and, and get to know all the, your new friends, all the wild animals and insects and things that are out there. And the plants, know their names. Um, and as you do that, all of a sudden you'll start to realize there's some things in the environment that you don't, you don't know. And so oftentimes learning is more about what you don't know than what you do know. And uh, just to give you a little uh, hand grenade here for your mind, um, one of the things you can think of is, as far as an organizing principle, when you go outside and think and kind of reframe your mind is, is think about just not nature, but put it in context of something. This is a watershed map of the United States. All those uh, various colors show you the watershed area. In other words, if rain dropped in those areas, like the central part there where all the purple is, if any raindrops dropped in those areas, they'd all end up um, at the end of the Mississippi River there in Louisiana. Um, every water drop will eventually end up there at one point or another. And if you look at California, which is really weird, this is a magnified view of uh, Southern California and California. Take a look at the San Joaquin Valley. That's an entire watershed and everything ends up into the Bay Area there. And look at San Diego County, where a lot of you are right now. There's more watersheds, individual watersheds in San Diego County than almost anywhere <laughs> in the rest of the state. I mean, they're just one after another. At the end of each one of them is an estuary or a lagoon. And uh, so when you can kind of organize yourself in terms of how you're going to enjoy nature, sometimes you see things you wouldn't normally see. So watersheds uh, are kind of a fun way to look at things. So how can we enhance our lives through nature? Well, remember I had those three things. Get outside, and you got to sense and know that you know you're outside, right? You think about it, and you want to connect to the, to the things you see. And I want to emphasize the connection thing one more time, and that is you want to learn who's out there and what their names are. The names aren't as important as, as putting a tag into your mind that helps you remember what they are. So for example, this is a picture of seeing Otis. I now know what sea and oak this is, and once in a while there'll be a blue one out here. I'll go, well, that's interesting. That must be a sea and oak this too, but it's a different one. So once you get to know the names of, of things in the environment, it helps you learn more and more and more because you find out, oh, well, I don't know the name of that. What's that? 
and then engage with everybody. Um, and I want to emphasize something here that's particularly um, topical, and that's the conversation about racism in, in, in America. And I'm sure we've all heard lots of viewpoints and ideas, and we have some of our own. Um, but, you know, um, I met uh, Drew Lanham, who was the, uh, uh, he did this video that's been pretty popular online, um, especially since what happened to George Floyd. Um, and uh, it's the rules of the black bird watcher. And I heard him speak at this conference in uh, Wisconsin. And this is three or four years ago. And I actually realized what it's like to live in a world that you're not really designed to be in. Um, and uh, nature uh, or people in different groups feels different. And I was talking to a group in Santa Monica Mountains in this, and I was saying how beautiful it is and how it makes me feel so you know, relaxed. And <laughs> this ranger who works with inner city kids, who brings them out to the Santa Monica Mountains. He says, you know, you just need to realize when these kids get off the bus, they're, they're terrified. They're scared of the snakes. They don't want to get dirty. This is not a place of relaxation for them. This is a horrible situation. And she has to spend most of the time helping them become comfortable with that environment. And that's a hugely important thing because when, uh, and it was a blind spot for me. I thought, gosh, I'll just bring people out in nature and they'll just fall in love with it. Well, I fall in love with it easily because that's how I was raised. I mean, that's just what I did. That's not the case for everybody. Um, and so I think what's important in nature, it's going to allow us an opportunity since it is our home, all of our homes. Um, and some of us, unfortunately, have been pushed away from it. Um, and sometimes nature represents things that aren't particularly pleasant for some people. Um, I think it's a great place to have a conversation about that. Um, and not assume things about people and what they may think. So here's a little quote from a friend of mine. Um, let's see if you recognize who it is. I'm going to close with this. Uh, we experience ourselves, our thoughts, our feelings as something separate from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our own personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. Um, and just think about that. I mean, we do create our own little bubbles because it's comforting. I mean, why do you want to push the envelope and be uncomfortable? But I really think right now that's what we're being challenged to do. Uh, and honestly, um, donating money or making some grand statement that you're in solidarity with Black Lives Matter, for example, I don't think it's going to cut it anymore. Um, if you're not doing something that doesn't make you uncomfortable, I don't think you've, you've made the effort to really make a difference in, in this very important conversation that's been going on the last few months. Our task then is we must free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. This message, it's not just about nature, it's about every one of us. Um, and that's what nature can help us understand. It's a vehicle by which we can make the world a better place. Um, I have a confession to make. I, I went into teaching and I got a teacher credential to teach biology. That's what it said anyway, and that's what's on my resume. Um, I wasn't teaching biology at all. <laughs> uh, my, my career in the classroom was an excuse to challenge people and kids to question their lives and to find the path that suited them best. My naturalist class that we do, I mean, we, you know, we learn about nature and, and all those wonderful things, but really it's a vehicle by which I help people understand themselves better. It's sort of a a hidden agenda, I guess. And, and I think most of the teachers you've had that you remember, um, that's probably what they did too. And so that's what I want you to think about nature uh, as. It's a place, God, isn't this a wonderful thing? There's all these, and then you're driving home, they're going, gosh, you know, and you start thinking about things. How it was beautiful, but I, I felt so much better about myself. And so that's what nature can do. Albert Einstein said that. That was a friend of mine. Actually, it was 
He passed away the same year I was born, so I'm kind of related to him. So um, depending on your orientation, nature has a way of uh, really connecting you in mysterious ways. So.